Our guest today is James Lomax, founder and director of Life Skills Acton Academy in Las Vegas, Nevada. James was born and raised in Maryland, but has called Nevada home since 2008. He has a BS from the United States Naval Academy and an MBA from Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. His time as a Naval officer was spent as a weapon systems officer in the FA-18F Super Hornet group. Imagine, he says, imagine Goose from the original Top Gun movie. That's what uh, he was doing. After leaving active duty Navy, he worked as a test engineer supporting electronic warfare system testing for military aircraft. And now, in addition to launching Life Skills Act and Academy, he's also a member of the advisory board for the National Microschooling Center, run by Don and Ashley Soifer, who you may recall I had on the podcast last year. James opened Life Skills Act and Academy in August of 2022 as a homeschool based microschool. Interestingly, he wanted to open as a recognized private school so that he could accept students who were eligible for the state's Opportunity Scholarship Program, which provides scholarship funding for low-income students to use at private schools. But because James doesn't have a Nevada state teacher's license, he wasn't able to open a private school in the state. It's regulatory barriers like these that unnecessarily prevent education entrepreneurship and the expanded supply of various learning options for families. Nevada in particular is one of the states with the most restrictive regulations on private schools, constraining the entire private education sector. We'll talk about James's journey to launching life skills as well as some of the other uh, regulatory barriers he's confronted in this experience on today's podcast. James Lomax, welcome to the Liberated Podcast. Oh, thank you so much, Carrie. It's an honor for me to be here. Looking forward to our discussion. Well, it's great uh, to have you here. I have had the the, the special opportunity to visit Life Skills Academy twice over the past yes. several months, uh, and to connect with you in in various forms. And it's just great to have you now on the podcast to talk a little bit more about your experience and this beautiful learning community that you've created. That's part of the Acton Academy Network, which of course I've talked a lot about on this podcast that was founded um, more than a decade ago by Laura and Jeff Sandifer and now has more than 280 schools around the world. So great to, uh, to, to talk with you about your experience launching one of the two Acton Academies that are now available in Las Vegas. But before we get into life skills and your process of becoming an education entrepreneur after a successful career in the Navy, I'd love to hear a little bit more about your childhood and what it was like for you growing up in Maryland, uh, what your kind of K-12 schooling was like there. Yeah, so I'll, I'll go way back and say uh, there's a couple things I always mention. Uh, I didn't figure out like the roots to why I'm doing what I'm doing for me actually started in kindergarten for me. Um, I didn't really recognize this till a few years ago, but um, when I was in kindergarten, uh, my teachers wanted to hold me back uh, from going to first grade. And I vividly remember this, them saying that I wasn't mature enough to go to first grade. And I overheard this conversation between teacher and my parents. And luckily my parents fought for me and I went on to first grade, but uh, it was a definite like wound that opened up there uh, where I thought I was just because, you know, the arbitrary kindergarten skill set that they say I didn't have. Uh, kindergarten me interpreted that as, a you know, I was less than and behind. And so uh, I had a chip on my shoulder, I think, and I probably still do. Uh, from that. And that's probably, you know, one of the reasons that I wanted to start a program like this. But uh, to actually answer your question, uh, I grew up in Maryland and uh, in Prince George's County, so right outside of Washington, D.C. Um, both my parents were college educated, but where we lived, the public school system uh, was not great. And, you know, in the 80s in that area, area like DC was the murder capital of the world and all the schools had metal detectors and my parents, you know, lower middle class, one car, but uh, they struggled so I could go to private school my whole life. And uh, I think if they hadn't made that struggle, my entire life path would have been very different. So um, I'm also very conventionally educated. So private school my whole life and uh, undergrad degree and master's degree. So 
um, being in the, I don't like the word, but being in the alternative school space is, is not something that people would expect from my pedigree, I guess. Right. So we'll get into that pathway shortly, but I'd love to hear a little bit about what made you decide to go to the U.S. Naval Academy and uh, and undertake a career in in the Navy, uh, specifically as a jet a fighter jet pilot and uh, working in that space. What was that like for you? Sure. Um, the big thing for me was in 1987, there was a big event when I was seven years old, and that was the release of the original Top Gun movie. And... <laughs> I saw that movie pretty early on and it was pretty clear to me at age seven that that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to fly on and off aircraft carriers. Uh, I just didn't know how you got there. And uh, I was also in the Boy Scouts at the time and Boys Life magazine from the Boy Scouts, they had an article with an F-14 pilot in it. And he said he went to the United States Naval Academy for his uh, for college. And I was like, okay, that's what you do. You go to the Naval Academy, then you go to flight school. So uh, that's what I set my sights on at age seven or eight and uh, didn't look back from there. So that's that's how, you know, set a dream at age seven and and went for it. So that's kind of how I operate. I think uh, once I get it in my head, I'm going to do it. So that is so great. And I think um, speaks to the fact that so many children and adolescents do develop passions and interests that if they're allowed to uh, cultivate those interests and and develop those skills they can achieve their goals and and they can um, reach their full potential in whatever way that looks for them and so that's very much like what Acton Academy tries to do starting with the individual looking at you know what what are their strengths and what are their goals their hero's journey which is kind of the centerpiece of the Acton Academy educational philosophy uh, and then supporting that uh, through their through education so at what point did you decide that you wanted to become an education entrepreneur, um, you know, kind of after this career in the Navy? Yeah, so that was uh, obviously way later. So I finished my time uh, flying jets in the Navy and then transitioned from that to being a, a flight test engineer. So somebody who, as a civilian, uh, runs and conducts flight tests. Uh, so doing the actual planning, execution, everything but flying the airplane. So, you know, objectives, everything from that point. So I was doing that, uh, started that in 2010 when I left active duty Navy. And then, uh, so I was here in Las Vegas and in 2010, around that time as well, I met my current wife. Uh, so our first daughter was born in 2014 and me being very conventionally educated by the time she was two, it's like, she has to be in the best preschools we can find. She needs to, you know, be on this path to go to college and all this stuff. And so we put her in the best preschool at age two. And what we found was the preschool was very, very, very focused on academics, kindergarten ready, kindergarten ready. So we get progress reports home saying like, well, you know, she can only count to 100, but she should be counting to 150 at this point. And uh, her Spanish comprehension is not where we want it to be. They're very high end school. And around this time, it's starting to click to me that maybe these aren't the important things. And so I started asking questions, which they don't like. Um, so I was like, I don't care about these things. I want to know what's happening on the playground. Is she making friends? Is she learning how to resolve conflict? And I just kept getting this blank stare. And they finally told me, we have to have her ready for kindergarten. It was very clear that this was all they cared about. And uh, that just didn't sit right, like in here for me. So I was like, ah, this doesn't feel right. There has to be a better way. And around the same time in my job as an engineer, you know, I'm pretty senior in that job. And so we get a lot of young engineers straight out of college. And a lot of these engineers, uh, you know, they went to very top universities with perfect grades. And we get them on the job and it's very clear very soon that the only thing they really learned how to do in their education was to take tests. Um, so they can't critically think, they can't solve a problem without the exact path given to them to solve the problem. Um, they don't have basic life skills. Um, so they don't know how to do their laundry. They don't know how to cook. They don't know how to, the basics of finance. They don't understand compound interest. And um, so it just really was like, well, if all these things 
if this is the best our best schools are producing, we're doing something wrong. And I started to think this is not the path I want for my daughter because the skills we need are different skills than what's being taught in school. And then there was a final element, the third element that brought it all together was in my job, I had to relearn calculus, which I hadn't done since an under, undergrad. And so I went to the wonderful website for Khan Academy. And within a week, I retaught myself calculus. And I was just blown away by this website. You know, all the all the things you could learn on this website, it was all for free. And I really got fascinated by the founder, Sal Khan. So I really started digging into his background. I read his amazing book called The One World Schoolhouse. And in that, he like shared his vision for what education could be. And uh, in that, I started um, just really diving in. And his vision just resonated with me. And he actually, as you probably well know, he started a school in Silicon Valley called the Khan Lab School. So I start looking in the Khan Lab School and I'm like, this is everything I want for my daughter. And, uh, but I don't live in Silicon Valley. <laughs> so I was like, why don't we have one of those here? And literally I did a Google search, uh, typed in schools like the Khan Lab School and Acton Academy came up. And I started clicking and delving into what Acton was. And I was like, this is everything I'm looking for. Uh, and it made sense now that the, the two were connected because Sal actually consulted with Jeff and Laura, the founders of Acton, when he was opening the Khan Lab School. So he did pull a lot of Acton-like elements into Khan Lab School. But as I delved into Acton, I discovered that anybody could open an Acton as uh, long as they really were committed, had some you know business background, and had children that they were willing to put in their school. So I was like, let's you know, it just became very clear to me at that point, like, we don't have this in Las Vegas. We need this. We need this very, very much. And if nobody else is going to do it, then I'm going to do it. And uh, I was off to the races at that point. And I imagine you thought it was going to be relatively straightforward. You know, you, you, you say you have an undergraduate degree from the U.S. Naval Academy. You uh, have an MBA. You're an engineer. Uh you know, you feel like you have these qualifications, certainly what the Acton Academy Network values and is looking mm -hmm. for. And so uh, what was that process like? When did you discover it wasn't going to be so simple and straightforward to just open a private school in Nevada? So the first inclination was um, as soon as I got approved to join the, Net the Acton Academy Network, my next meeting actually, or the first ever meeting I took was actually with uh, Don and Ashley Soifer. Uh, and at the time they were running the Southern Nevada Urban Micro Academy. So I went to them and said, this is what I'm trying to do. And we got together and I got to tour the Southern Nevada Urban Micro Academy. And, you know, we talked through everything and like they told me what the hiccups were going to be. Uh, licensing was going to be a big one. And they said, hey, sit down and talk to these two young ladies. They're, they're trying to open a micro school right now. They're running into a lot of hiccups. They can help you understand what the problem is. And those two young ladies were Sarah and Yamila from Bloom Academy. So my second meeting ever was with uh, Sarah and Yamila, who you had on your podcast. And they were telling me about the troubles they were having with getting a location um, and zoning. And I was like, okay, um, I'm military. So regulation and figuring out how to things work just come naturally to me as a military officer. So let me dig in and try to figure out what the problems were. And so I just spent probably about six months educating myself on zoning laws and the regulations. And yeah, I discovered that I, I was going to open my act in, in the city of Henderson, which is a suburb of Las Vegas. And it was not clear cut in any sense of any way. I, I already knew from the state level that um, I was not qualified to open a private school. Because again, like you said earlier, I don't have a teaching degree uh, so that or an administrator or teaching license in the state. So therefore I can't open a private school. But luckily, I, you know, I'd seen other micro schoolers. We have very permissive homeschool laws so I could operate under the homeschool law. So that was great. But then um, when I looked through the zoning law in the city of Henderson, there was no such category for like a learning center. 
which is typically what we call ourselves if we are not private schools. So I was trying to figure out how do I make this happen? So I'm very proactive. So instead of uh, just waiting, I went and actually met with the city, uh, their educational staff and said, hey, this is what I'm trying to do. Gave them my pitch deck. And they said, we'd love it. This sounds great. And I said, well, how do I do this? <laughs> and then they sent me to the zoning office. And this is where things went downhill. Um, <laughs> so the zoning office, like we went back and forth for a week and they're trying to understand what it is I was trying to do. And they're like, this is not a school. And I'm like, correct, not a school, learning center. And I'm like, so when I apply for my business license in the city, what category do I use? And they thought about it for a week and they kept asking more and more questions. And it got down to the fact that, you know, you're going to have children with you all day. And I was like, yes. And they're like, okay, uh, we figured it out. You need to be a daycare center. And I said, well, wh why is that? I don't have children of that age. And they said, well, we're concerned that you're going to shove children into like a mini mall and they won't get to get outside all day. So if you're a daycare center, you have to do that. And then me personally, I, I, I was biting my tongue at this point because I said, you know, in my head, I'm thinking, shouldn't we let the free market decide this? Like, shouldn't the parents be the ones? I was like, I have no intentions. I think I'm very big on children being outside, climbing trees and playing. So I would never do that. But even if I wanted to, I, that should be a parent decision. And they should be the ones to decide like, hey, this is not the environment we want our children in. But uh, anyway, I decided, okay, if that's what you want, I will, I will start down the path. I'm going to open as a daycare center. And I started the training and I just realized after the first training session that this was going to be just not what I needed. And so I was like, there has to be another way. There has to be another way. So I started looking to see, uh, we have a lot of tutoring centers, like the commercial tutoring centers here. And I was like, okay. Well, how are they licensed? They're brick and mortar. And really, there's no category for them in our city zoning either. So they just have this miscellaneous business license. Um, so I was like, okay, I'm going to apply for the same category of license that they do. And uh, that's what I did. But then location also turned out to be challenging because, again, I, I believe in outdoor space. So finding a location that has adequate outdoor space and meets all these requirements was very challenging. Took about a, almost a year to find the appropriate space. And this is in the heart of COVID as well. So I'm starting this search, you know, in beginning of 2021. And uh, so dealing with certain locations that don't, you know, that want children to be wearing masks at age five all day and, and, and vaccination requirements and navigating all that. And uh, went through six locations. I had one location that turned me down because they didn't want the liability of the children crossing a street to get to the park across the street. So it was just this, you know, sea of navigating this this storm of trying to find the right location. But eventually, I made it work. So amazing, yes. And the space that you have now is lovely. It does have that outdoor space. It's room to grow for you. So it's definitely a, a good spot for you now. But I want to go back a little bit to the fact that you did want to open as a private <laughs> school, and that might have actually streamlined some of these other issues. Um, you know, one of the things we talk about is that micro schools or these homeschool collaboratives, um, you know, they're kind of a whole new category, a whole new box and local and state regulators often don't know what to do with that box because it doesn't look like what they think of as traditional schooling. But for you, you actually were okay with the idea of opening a registered private school. Um, and in fact, wanted to do that because you wanted to be able to have you know, students with greater access to your programs through the state's opportunity scholarship um, policies. And so what is it about Nevada's uh, private school laws that you find, you know, so frustrating? Uh, the biggest frustration is, uh, and I believe in religious freedom, but it's almost like a hypocrisy. So for me, as we have two categories here, private schools, in Nevada, the regular private schools and the exempt private schools and exempt private schools for the most part are for religious re reasons. So regular private schools to open a private school requires a administrator or liaison who has a teacher's license in the state of Nevada 
and a administrator license in the state of Nevada. And all the teachers that you hire have to be uh, licensed teachers in the state of Nevada. Now, on the same thing, I can open a private school under the exempt category being a religious school. And all those requirements go away when I'm an exempt school. So it just didn't make sense and it still doesn't uh, to me for why it's so different if I'm a religious school versus not. Cause it's like, if we really care about the outcomes, shouldn't they both be the same? And obviously the model I'm running Acton Academy most of the time, uh, it's it's really set up as a private school model. There, there are other obviously hybrid programs or homeschool based program Acton's like mine, but uh, most states accept Acton Academy as a private school. And in fact, even the other Acton here in Las Vegas is a private school because they're um, the two ladies who founded that act in have the right credentials to start a school. So right now I'm basically running a similar program to them. They're a private school and I'm not uh, just because I don't have a teacher's license. Uh, I just find it so astonishing that there are these regulatory hurdles that prevent someone as qualified and experienced and successful as you from opening a private school that families are are clamoring for. You know, Acton Academy continues to grow in popularity um, globally. And so I, I, I think I mentioned earlier, Nevada has some of the most restrictive private school laws in the country. Um, very few states have this level of barrier for uh, founders. And it really constrains, as I mentioned, the private education sector more generally. So, you know, from from your perspective, what would be uh, it's sort of an easy, quote unquote, easy policy fix um, in that way? Yeah, the easiest fix would be kind of like other states like Texas, for instance, like they have a similar category, uh, but the exempt private schools are anybody can be an exempt private school. So. Just either you choose path A, where you uh, are going down this route of uh, we want to use it, we want to basically look like a public school, uh, or you choose path B and we're exempt. And path B may mean that you know there's a there's a, a statement that has to be on your marketing that says, hey, we're an exempt private school in the state of Nevada. This means this means this this and this, and just so the parents are aware. Uh, because even our exempt private schools in Nevada, for religious reasons, there's a statement they have to use. But just to open up that category, just like almost every other state does, uh, is an easy, easy solution to this problem. Yeah. So remove that hurdle, remove that barrier to entry, that kind of occupational licensing requirement to open a private school by enabling secular private schools to have the same um, the same exemptions, the same requirements as religiously affiliated private schools and, and instead of instead of treating them differently and unfairly. Um, and that really would have gone a long way, it seems, in making your startup experience a little bit easier. Of course, zoning is always a challenge for education right. entrepreneurs. Uh, so you may not have escaped that entirely, but it, it likely would have been a little bit easier. Um, and again, was something that you wanted to do. That was kind of your initial your initial thought. Sure. So, so you opened after this, uh, this extended period of time, uh, dealing with local regulators, finding a space and then opening in August of 2022. So tell us a little bit about what these last several months have been like for you. Oh, it's been a huge journey. Uh, once we open because, uh, I got approved to join the active network. I want to say in March of 2021, and didn't open by design my school until August, 2022, because again, this education not being my world, uh, I really wanted to take the time to get the time to get everything right. So the other act in here uh, in Las Vegas opened a year prior. So I spent a lot of time with them, got to see the mistakes they made. And, uh, and I told myself, I'm never, you know, I'm not gonna make any of the same mistakes they made. And I think I've made every single last one of them, but, uh, I always say like in an acting program, nobody learns more, you know, on the hero's journey than the owner does. So I think this journey so far, I've learned more in the past six months than I, I can say I've ever learned. Uh, it's probably, you know, even compared to flying on aircraft carriers at night, like this is by far the toughest thing I've done. 
but it's also super rewarding. Uh, the victories you see like daily with the children, like they're not huge victories. There's these small like glimmers of like, you see the light coming on or you see somebody, you know, I'm not, I don't spend all day in the studio every single day. So when I'm in the studio, maybe I haven't seen a particular learner for a few weeks. And, you know, when they first started, they were this shy kid who didn't really say much. And I come in and now four weeks later, I see them just a ball of energy and they're leading and they're upholding the rules. And uh, it's just amazing to see those transformations. So that's where it's super rewarding for me because I can look at that each child and think like, what would their life potentially be different if they were back in, you know, a private school or a public school right now being told to sit down and basically shut up uh, based on what they, you know, compared to what they can do now. And they're leading, you know, leading discussions, Socratic discussions at age five and six and all these amazing things. It's, it's just amazing to me. And your older daughter, who's eight, is in your Acton Academy. Uh, and, you know, I'm curious to if we could talk a little bit more about what you're seeing now as the Acton Academy philosophy kind of plays out in real time for you. I mean, you said that one of your real motivations was making sure that your daughter um, wasn't just focused on test scores, that the academics weren't the only thing that was prioritized in her uh, in her youth. And also recognizing the young people that you saw coming out of these this kind of um, these prestigious universities or this kind of conveyor belt system of standard schooling and seeing that they were really lacking a lot of the qualities and characteristics that you think are, are so valuable, particularly uh, in today's economy. So how is that how is that manifesting in the Acton Academy world so far for you? Yeah, it's been super interesting with my daughter. Like she is, uh, I'd say, somewhat shy and reserved, kind of like me. And uh, so I actually had concerns like, how is she going to do in this environment where she had done kindergarten and first grade in a um, in a conventional school? So she gets to uh, our environment. And one of the first things that she gets to do is our business fair. And I didn't know how that was going to go, where she's going to have to you know, start a business from scratch and sell stuff to the to the public. And what we found was that she thrived in that. She loved it. And like, it turned out to be like just a great thing for her. Uh, so much so that in fact, after our business fair, she started another business right away. And she moved directly to do the business fair at the other act. And it was a few weeks later. And now I think as a result of that, she's joined the Girl Scouts. And like, she's literally going to start cookie sales this weekend. And she's super excited about that. So there's this entrepreneurial fire that's kind of developed for her. And, you know, we don't talk much about academics, so that's not priority for us. But like academically, it's been kind of amazing because even though I'm completely bought in on acting, there's always, you know, just a little bit of question, like, even though you've seen it work, like, will this work for my child? Right. Does she need somebody to instruct her? And just like the growth I've seen in her like traditional academic skills, like her writing, even though, you know, we're not sitting there forcing the right book reports, her writing has gotten so much better. Her reading comprehension is so much better. And that's just from reading and writing. It's not from, you know, us instructing because we don't do that here. So it, it it's just been so amazing. And then just to see talking to parents, all the parents that are here, they have these, um, you know, they know their own school experiences and they, they, they know this is right for their children and their hearts, but they can't, um, they still have that hard time wrapping their heads around it, you know, cause it's so different. And then, you know, they come in and they're like, oh, I want to talk about, you know, academics. But then they start saying like, that one of my favorites was we had a parent come in and she's like, She's like, I'm not seeing a lot come home, but like, I know they're learning because she has a, a middle school age child and her child with us. And she said that her middle schooler saw something and didn't know what like the prefix for a thousand was. And her 10 year old who's with me instantaneously corrected his brother and is like, nope, that's Killy. Like he he knew right away and was adamant about it. And like, 
Uh, she's like, wow, I know he didn't learn that in his last private school, just these little things and things he knew about ancient Greece that he had picked up and his knowledge of, you know, animals of like our studios fascinated with uh, salamanders and oxalotls. So we, we've explored that a little bit because they all really, you know, they all really have a passion for animals in the studio. So just their knowledge that gained in those areas, like it, it totally shows and the parents are seeing it. So. So maybe we can delve into that just a little bit further, James, because Acton Academy uh, focuses on self learner driven education. It's all kind of self directed. Um, and yet you're saying that these students are learning academics. And I wonder how that happens in the absence of coercion. How are they learning academics as well as, of course, all of these other, um, you know, social skills and conflict resolution skills. And they do a lot of group projects and they kind of develop the rules of the of the of the studio together. Uh, and the adults really act as guides of, for all of this. But but how are they and, and in what way are they learning academics when they're not being forced to do so? Yeah, I think I, I always tell parents, prospective parents, that if a child is being forced to learn something, they actually aren't going to learn it. Um, they're going to take in the information. So first, that all education is self-education. So the child has to decide to take it in. It's just a matter of what their motivation is. So in conventional schools, it's there's repercussions for not performing well on tests. But when you test children who've been tested, you test them three weeks later, and most of them are going to fail that test because they took it on to learn it, but it didn't it didn't matter to them. So they didn't absorb it. So here uh, we do a variety of things and the children have a lot of freedom. So there is a schedule in Acton and there is a uh, our learning design is is very solid as to what we're trying to convey. So we try to expose them at the surface level to a lot of different things and try to figure out where their interests lie. But we also spend about an hour and a half of the day what looks like traditional, somewhat traditional academics. We're doing math and language arts. Uh, for our five and six-year-olds, they're using the Montessori method, so they're hands-on. But for seven and above, they are doing mastery-based computer programming uh, so they're doing it to mastery, meaning that there's no grades, but they, they have to do it till they get to 100%. And this is the part where I talked about Sal Khan and his philosophy of mastery based. So in the conventional school system, what you see is you have all these gaps in your education, because what happens is you take, you work on one subject for a week and you take a test at the end of that week, especially with math. And math is very additive. So you get a 70% on that test. Well, there's 30% of that material you didn't understand. And as you keep going week after week, you're building a foundation on this. And eventually that 70% complete foundation floor after floor, eventually by, you know, grade four or five topples over and you think you're poor at math. So for us, like for the traditional academic side, when we come in and, and the mathematics and language arts program assesses them, they typically assess below grade level and which we don't really care about. The reason they're assessing below grade level is what we find is that there were gaps that had developed and we're going back in and filling in the gaps using these programs. And, and what they what we've seen so far is that once they fill in those gaps, they go really fast. Um, and because they're doing game-based programming, it's actually interesting. They enjoy it. They look forward to it. Um, so, but again, so that's a big part of it but I don't think that's the secret sauce to act in. Um, I think we do that an hour and a half a day. And like I said, our, our children have already, all of them have already grown at least a grade level in the first six, six months. But like, I think the secret sauce that makes this all work is the fact that we don't teach them like what to learn. So we're not saying you have to learn this. Our focus is teaching them how to learn. So it's really the Socratic method the fact that we don't answer, our guides don't answer questions in the studio. So a question is always answered with a question and we want them to develop tools to, to learn how to answer their own problems, solve their own problems and figure things out. So it's really that ability, that critical thinking ability and critical reasoning that they, they learn here. I think that's the secret sauce. So we are preparing them to learn how to learn. And then once they know how to learn, they can basically learn anything of interest. 
So even when they're, you know, if you put an Acton student in front of a standardized test, they typically do very well because they really understand the critical reasoning part of it and they can think through the problem and get the right answer. I was really blown away, uh, James, when I visited your studio uh, just recently and had an opportunity to talk with the students in your in your program uh, who interviewed me with all right. kinds of different questions that were extremely challenging. You know, tell me about your biggest failure in life. Tell me about who have been your most important mentors. What are your current challenges? It was just really thought provoking questions. Um, and, and they had really thought through those and then asked, you know, follow up questions re related to that. So I was really impressed, as you say, with their critical thinking skills, their communication ability, um, the way that they're at ease with adults and their peers in ways that I think you don't see uh, as authentically in conventional schooling. And I think that maybe gets to my um my question now where you talked about not liking the term alternative education, and I agree uh, that it's it's not an ideal term, but I'm curious what you think about the future of alternative education, of these kind of non-traditional uh, educational models that are more student-centered, student-driven, that reject a lot of the kind of standardized uh, trappings of modern schooling. Um, what do you think is the future of that movement? I think the movement's only going to grow. Uh, there's a lot of people right now, parents that are super interested in what we do. Uh, but they're like, uh, the, the question you get all the time is, what about college? Is this going to prepare them for college? And the answer for us is yes. But like, they haven't had the opportunity yet to most of them, because most of the actants here in Las Vegas are, are you know, one and two years old. Um, they haven't had the opportunity to talk to an act in high school student. And I think if you spend five minutes with any act in high school student, all your questions are answered because kind of like you said, you saw with our, you know, we're ages five to 11, you saw our children and the ability to communicate with adults and um, they're learning that at a very young age. And that's one of the things that just gives them just an amazing advantage in, in life, as I think, is they are not intimidated. They don't see adults as this authority figure. That doesn't mean they're lawless, but they understand their, their, their role and how to talk to people in general. So even in the college application process, what we see is acting students do amazingly well because they know they know how to reach out to adults. So usually when an acting student's applying to a college, one, they, they wanna be there for a specific reason. There's something they wanna do that that college is probably the best at. So typically for a normal student, they're just gonna apply, submit their transcript and hope for the best. Where an acting student is probably, you know, let's say they wanna study chemistry. They wanna to apply to that school because they know that that particular school does research in this particular field. And they're going to reach out to that department chair. And the way they communicate with that department chair is going to be like, like a mature adult. And that department chair does not see that ever. And so what almost always happens is that department chair then walks down to the admissions office and says, like, this is the person we want. Um, and, and they get into college and get scholarships at a very high rate. But the majority of them typically decide that they don't need college. Um, what they see is uh, they've, you know, by the time they're in high school, they've started at least 10 or 11 businesses every year. They've already figured out what their, at least one of their callings is and how to get there. So they've already done apprenticeships in that business. And usually a lot of times by 16 or 17, they're already running a six figure business that they've started um, and they just go do that. So like once you can see what these children are capable of, it's a very easy decision for the parents. And once they start seeing that, it's just going to grow and grow because right now we still are overcoming like parents get it, but they are having a hard time seeing seeing the vision uh, for their child because they're still in this like they have to go to college paradigm. And if you're not doing if you're not sitting them at a desk all day, making them do academics, uh, how, how on earth could they ever be ready to go to college? So as, as, as the movement grows and we have more and more older children and they see the difference and not just for acting and any, 
self-directed learning environment like Bloom Academy here, you're going to see the same things. Um, so as the parents start seeing these older children go out into the world, I think that is going to be the breaking point uh, for this to become a more normal and more requested model. I think that's great. And I think it's also important to point out too that um, Acton Academies are extremely diverse, not only in terms of um, who the founders are and kind of the different experiences and perspectives that the founders bring, but also the communities themselves. I know um, the other Acton Academy in Las Vegas, Acton Academy Red Rock, that's been around just slightly longer than you, um, has a quarter of its students who are on the autism spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so this kind of education can really work for all kinds of different children. Um, and that diversity, I, I think, really can add to the community. Um, so I'm curious, James, what's next for you with Life Skills Action Academy? What are your plans uh, for the next few years there? Yeah, so you actually kind of hit about where we're going. Um, we, my plan is to grow and how we want to do that is because, you know, I, I kind of talk about the Tesla, the Tesla model of schooling. So uh, if you're not familiar with Tesla did, the car company was, they started off with this really high end car uh, with, and they had a vision that they were going to, you know, increase the number of electric cars in, in the world. And how they were going to do that was, you know, first they were going to go really high end and make this high end car. And then slowly, as people started to adopt it, uh, do lower and lower end cars, meaning more and more people could drive electric cars. And I'm trying to do basically the same thing. So right now, you know, since we are tuition based, uh, there's not a lot of families that can afford what we're offering. And, you know, if I could put an Acton Academy in the east side of Las Vegas in a low economic area, like those children would thrive, I think, in this environment and the opportunities that we could provide. So since we are, Acton's kind of like a business school for children, one of the things that uh, lessons I saw from another Acton out in Placer County, Placer County, California, was what they did was to make it more accessible and be business focused as they grew, they started buying other small businesses and then they used those profits from those small businesses and they let the children in the schools get experience in those small businesses. And the profit from those small businesses went to fund scholarships for other lower income children to attend. So within five years, I hope to have at least, you know, one more small business and to have our campus here be up to 150 total. So I, I want to make this type of learning more accessible to more people. Ah, oh, so great. Yes. And you're talking about Matt Boudreaux's Acton Academy yes. Classer outside of Sacramento, California. That's also experienced phenomenal growth there. And 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 great to hear about that increased accessibility. Um through entrepreneurial pursuits. So that's exciting. So James, as we wrap up, um, you know, what is your best advice to um, new or aspiring education entrepreneurs who want to start a private school, a micro school, an Acton affiliate, you know, what would, what would be your best advice for them? Uh, a few things. One is like, just like anything in life, there's never going to be the perfect time to do it. Um, so if you're, if you're finding yourself just waking up or in the middle of the night and like, this is constantly on your mind, like the time is right. And I, I think the other thing is, um, is be very, very clear. And this applies to any business. I, I find very clear what your mission is and what your values are, because, you know, there may be economic uh, realities that may try to get you to, to, deviate from that, like take a family that's maybe not the right fit just because it'll make you know, the bottom line look a little bit nicer. But uh, don't do that because it's especially in these small learning environments and micro schools, like that's going to be super problematic. One wrong family uh, can poison an entire tribe. So, and then be very clear with the families um, what it is you do and what it is you don't do, like who who's a good fit and who is not. So this isn't, you know, I love acting Academy, but this isn't the right path for everybody. So what I love is like when I do talk to a family that is not the right fit for what we're doing, 
I love that there's like 24 other micro schools here locally that I can say, well, maybe this is going to be a good fit. Let me introduce you to the founder. So just really be clear about what you do and who you serve. And I think that'll will serve you well. I love that. And I love that um, cross collaboration. I think that that's what I certainly see in these clusters of micro schools and education entrepreneurship across the country. There is that sense of um, sharing resources, referring families to other programs that might be a better fit. And, and in, in many cases they are, and then it's, it's this true, um, ecosystem of education options for families where they are really able to find the best spot. And of course, uh, La the greater Las Vegas area is becoming a hub of these education programs, especially alternative education and micro schools with, uh, as you said, about 25 micro schools within a 10 mile radius of the strip serving around 300 learners at the moment. But Don and Ashley at the National Microschooling Center would say that that number is going to more than double, they expect, within the next 18 months. So uh, such an exciting time there. And James, if my listeners and viewers would like to uh, connect with you and learn more about Life Skills Act and Academy, what's the best way for them to reach you? Best way, the website is uh, lifeskillsacademylv.com. And then on social media, uh, pick your social media. You'll find us, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, in Twitter, just Life Skills Academy LV. Uh, we post very often. Uh, so you'll, you'll definitely understand my views about education uh, if you see our social media. Just feel free to reach out. Uh, I love talking to parents. I just spent uh, a week or last week, had a conversation with uh, entrepreneurs who are in Louisiana who wanted to understand more about Acton. So uh, feel free to reach out. I love talking about education and entrepreneurship in general. James Lomax, thank you again for being on the Liberated Podcast. Thank you for having me.